Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. Smithville Fiber, the Giga City Company, a philanthropic community partner since 1922, and a proud supporter of numerous community organizations. More information at smithville.com. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you. As the country prepares for Veterans Day, salute the Hoosier men and women of our military. Learn about the incredible Indiana World War I Centennial Commission as the organization commemorates 100 years of sacrifice and service. And go behind the headlines as you explore the history of the Donut Girls, Salvationists who served alongside frontline soldiers. Meet John C. Walter, a Columbus native and B-17 Air Force pilot who flew 35 combat missions during World War II. And welcome Indiana's only military band, the 38th Infantry Division Band, and the Brass Quintet to the studio. Take the time to honor Hoosier heroes tonight on the Weekly Special. Welcome to the Weekly Special. I'm Erica Sagone. After the end of World War I, President Woodrow Wilson declared November 11th a day of solemn pride in the heroism of our military. And today, that tradition continues through Veterans Day activities across the state. It's been 100 years since the United States entered World War I. To coincide with the anniversary, Indiana formed a centennial committee to honor the 135,000 Hoosiers who served during the Great War. To honor the 100th anniversary of the Great War, the state created Indiana's World War I Centennial Commission. It's interesting, when you go back to World War I, um, it was known as the Great War. The war to end all wars was the idea. That's the war that we now almost have forgotten. There's some significant contributions that have been more or less lost to history in the last hundred years. And so with the centennial, with the state of Indiana, and thinks it's really important to help educate the people and talk about the sacrifices, the challenges, and the contributions Indiana made. President Woodrow Wilson declared war on April 6, 1917. Enlisted Indiana soldiers were among the first units to land on European soil. Placing Hoosiers in the spotlight as the first to strike at the enemy and the first to make the ultimate sacrifice. The first person who fired in World War I in Europe was a guy named Alex Arch from South Bend, Indiana, all the way back in October 23, 1917. Soon afterwards, James Bethel Gresham is one of the first three men to die on the fields of France. James Bethel Gresham is from Evansville, Indiana. Additional Hoosiers soon followed as the Indiana National Guard quickly mobilized, with guard units forming the 38th Infantry Division and the 84th Lincoln Division with neighboring states. In addition, Indiana's renowned 150th Field Artillery Regiment was one of the hand-picked units to make up the 42nd Rainbow Division. In all, over 135,000 Indiana soldiers served during World War I with more than 3,000 of them making the ultimate sacrifice. You could probably pick almost any battle of significance along the Western Front and find Indiana soldiers involved with it. We've decided, instead of just talking about the generals and the admirals, we want to tell the stories of everyday people and how they played into World War I. Lieutenant Aaron Fisher of Lyle Station, Indiana, would become the state's most highly decorated African-American soldier he received the Distinguished Service Cross. Lieutenant Samuel Woodfill, who single-handedly incapacitated three German machine gun nests, earning the Medal of Honor. Ofa Johnson of Kokomo, who became the first woman to enlist in the Marine Corps. The people we've picked made enormous contributions uh, to the war effort, but they weren't the, the top leadership. They weren't you know, sitting in Washington, D.C. making decisions. They were actually either on the front lines or at the home front making contributions and helping the war effort. 
As the soldiers and the officers come back from the war, some of them went back to the farm, some of them moved to the cities. They were prepared for a hierarchical, you know, military kind of operation. They could fit into corporations easily and would all chip in to work together to make sure that, it, that not only Indiana but the United States began to really prosper and grow after the war. There's story after story after story that shows the impact that that war had on Indianapolis and then the state as a whole. And sharing these stories continues to be the driving mission of the Centennial Committee. Throughout the next two years, the Commission will hold public programs and events throughout the state. It shows that we still respect the contributions of veterans, whether they fought and returned to the United States a week ago, or 100 years ago, or 200 years ago. All of those things have helped us become the nation that we are today, to maintain the freedoms and liberties that we still possess. All the veterans of today, I think, are really being honored as we do these ceremonies for the soldiers who fought 100 years ago. The World War I Centennial Commission will be hosting events throughout the next year. For an updated listing or to learn more about the committee's mission, visit worldwaroncentennial.org. And as we saw, one part of that mission is to salute the sacrifice of everyday Hoosiers. One such story centers around the Salvation Army and a group of courageous women that brought the comforts of home to the front lines. By the time of World War I, the Salvation Army had spread across the United States, bringing its ministry of soup, soap, and salvation to thousands in need. Led by one of the country's first female commander-in-chiefs, Evangeline Booth. When it was clear that the United States was going to be joining World War I, they talked about it and they said, you know, if we're going to be sending American boys over there, we need to go with them. We need to find a way to go with them. The 12 hand-selected Salvationists arrived on the European shore within days of the first arrival of American soldiers. Among the women was Helen Proviance, a Huntington, Indiana native whose hard work and determination made her a perfect candidate for shipment overseas. They set up huts, they set up tents, they served coffee and hot chocolate, and they prayed with soldiers and helped out where they could, giving news of home, just giving hope, because you know these young men were so homesick. And so having someone there on the front line with them who could act as a mother, who could act as a little bit of home, really meant a lot to these young boys. And the Salvationists really were on the front lines, often closer to the action than many of the commanders. General Pershing was uncomfortable with the idea of women being so close to the action. He didn't want them on the front lines because he didn't want to be responsible for them. And the response from the Salvation Army and from the women who went over were, you're not responsible for us, we're responsible for ourselves, we chose to do this. And so they did, they followed along with the soldiers, they followed the ammunition trains, they were right there with them. And they got muddy and dirty and cold. And you know, Helen came back and told stories about how she would wake up in the morning completely covered in frost. She had 19 different spots just on her feet that had turned black from frostbite. But it was worth it for them, it really was, because it meant that they could be there, especially when these boys would come back from battle, and they were boys. They were very young. When they would come back, the Salvationists would be standing there waiting for them, and they would literally divide the soldiers up into two lines, the ones who would survive and the ones who would not. And they would go with the ones who would not. They would guide them over, make sure that their eyes were washed, hold their hands, and stay with them for their last moments. By October of 1917, edible luxuries were completely gone. Helen and fellow Salvationist Margaret Sheldon knew they needed to come up with something to boost the spirits of the despondent soldiers. They were trying to figure out what kind of a goodie they could make that would give these, these young boys some hope. And she and Margaret looked at the supplies that they had. They said, okay, we have sugar, we have lard, uh, we have flour. What can we do with this? And they thought, donut. We can make donuts. These are the perfect ingredients for donuts. And so the first night that they cooked, they were only able to make about 150 of them. And the word spread. 
and it was went from one camp to the next to the next and all of a sudden they had literally thousands of American soldiers going, we want donuts too. The women quickly devised a way to mass produce their donuts on the battlefield, training other Salvationists and repurposing available tools. Wine bottles became makeshift rolling pins. Empty condensed milk cans and shaving cream tubes provided the true donut shape. By the year's end, the Salvationists could make up to 9,000 fresh donuts every single day for their grateful American soldiers. And so they were so excited that it was the highlight of their letter back home. And the newspapers back home started to pick up on it that all of these men are talking about donut girls. Who are these donut girls? As the word spread, donations to the Salvation Army skyrocketed, as did the popularity of donuts themselves. By war's end, over 250 Salvationists would serve overseas, but none were more famous than the donut girl herself. Indiana's own Helen Proviance. The story of the Donut Girls continued along with Helen and got bigger and bigger and bigger. And you may be familiar with something called Donut Day. That started back in 1938 in Chicago by the Salvation Army. It was such a, a huge success that Donut Day was actually declared a national holiday. It's celebrated every year. So it's amazing that a hundred years later, the story is still being told, it's still being shared. I think the legacy that, that Helen and all of the other donut girls left behind is this, this legacy of hope. That even in dark times, even in really painful times, there's always that ray of hope and sometimes it looks like a donut. The Salvation Army kicks off its annual Red Kettle Christmas campaign this weekend. To learn more about this or other ongoing community initiatives, visit their website, SalvationArmyIndiana.org. From the trenches of World War I to the skies of World War II, Hoosier heroes have changed our history. We travel now to Columbus, Indiana to remember the brave efforts of a B-17 Air Force pilot. John Walter is in the midst of a sentimental journey. By all outward appearances, it would be difficult to tell that this tall, soft-spoken Columbus, Indiana resident would have witnessed some remarkable, breathtaking experiences as he soared high above Germany as a bomber pilot during World War II. Being up and looking down, particularly when you uh, did aerobatics, you know, be upside down. And, you know, the sky is <laughs> at your feet, and the earth is at your head. <laughs> and so it uh, was quite a thrill. John keeps a box of old photos close at hand to remind him of those who served alongside him. He's also documented their contributions in a memoir entitled My War, a document of his time in the U.S. Air Force. His book begins with early memories of the time when he heard that Pearl Harbor had been bombed in December 1941. As school ended, it became apparent that the disagreements going on overseas were not to be settled in the very near future. Also, it was becoming obvious that Uncle Sam would soon offer me a personal invitation to participate in his military activities. John did as many of his friends were doing and enlisted in the U.S. Army. For years, he had dreamed of being a pilot, and by the summer of 1944, he was fully qualified as a bomber pilot and prepared to head to the European theater. On August 7th, he wrote, I had to pinch myself as I remembered that only 17 years previously, Lindbergh had been the first to fly solo across the Atlantic. Now here I was about to do it myself. Above about uh, 25,000 feet, the temperatures are usually 50 below zero. Out of your oxygen mask, you get condensation. And in a short period of time, down the front of my jacket, I'd have a big icicle. So frostbite was a real enemy. There's a tail gunner coming out. Watch out for fighters. In his book, John documents several of his most harrowing experiences, 
such as his first mission, when he had to fly clear across Germany, dodging anti-aircraft gunfire and enemy planes. Pieces of shrapnel came through the windows in the top of the cockpit. One of them hit Tom on the left side, just above his flak suit and above his collarbone. He straightened up briefly, then slumped over. In a matter of seconds, he was dead. A piece of shrapnel about the size of my thumb, and uh, it's jagged, and it's, of course, spinning or rotating, or it's not floating, and it's nasty stuff. In his book, John remembered, we walked in the front door of the hut, fully expecting to see Tom sitting on his bed. Of course, he was not there. His belongings were also gone. In the time it took us to get back to our quarters, the squadron orderlies had come in and collected and taken away all of his belongings. It was as if he had never existed. Germany looked like England from the air. And uh, it looked benign until they started shooting. In John's book, he tells of other harrowing stories, such as the time when he watched a fellow student pilot fall to his death in a training accident before he left the United States, or the time his navigator's oxygen mask malfunctioned, killing him in midair. In all, John Walter and his crew flew 35 successful missions over Germany, completing his final mission near VE Day in May 1945. Today, John is 96. He continues to keep the memories of those men alive by looking through some precious old images of his time in the service. Memories he also keeps close to his heart. As he writes, There's an old saying that there are no atheists in foxholes. Well, I'm here to tell you that there are no atheists in the cockpit either. Some higher power must be watching over us. And for that, I'm thankful. The Atterbury Bacaller Museum in Columbus has preserved much of the military history of Indiana aviators. And if you visit, you may just see Mr. Walter. He's a regular volunteer there. Get hours and directions at atterburybacallerairmuseum.org. We are extremely honored to welcome our next musical guests. Headquartered in Indianapolis, the 38th Infantry Division Band is Indiana's only military band, performing in both military and civic capacities throughout the state. The role of the Army musician has changed over time. After the Civil War, the musicians that returned back to their homes would congregate the local units and they would form small, loosely structured bands. Indiana had several band contingents scattered throughout our state. It wasn't until into World War II that these various regimental bands were consolidated into one particular band and renumbered, renamed to the 38th Infantry Division Band. We have been sustained as the only military band in the state of Indiana. But of all the National Guard bands, only eight are actually considered to be Infantry Division Bands. This means that these eight bands, Indiana being one of them, could be activated and deployed into combat operations. And currently we are at our full authorized strength, which is 41. That would be 40 musicians and one commanding officer. When a person is interested in enlisting in the Army Band's program, they have to undergo a rigorous audition. We're looking for the finest musicians. The additional training that goes on is exactly what's required as the core training that all soldiers in the Army would undergo. Our primary mission is strictly to serve through music. Music provides esprit de corps for the soldiers. They are lifted up, given the will to fight and to win. It elevates the spirit and the mood. I feel that the most important mission of the band is to connect with our audiences. Community outreach is very important and so we want to help to create a connection between the citizen and the military here in Indiana. It's important that our public knows that the U.S. Army as well as all our armed forces aren't just fighting forces. The Army has many roles. One of the missions of the Army bands in general is to tell America's story. 
And I think this is something that is critical to make that connection between the army, the music, and the civilian population, is to never forget periods of time through our history that we endured and survived and succeeded, and how we can connect it with the music. For a lot of the older people in the audiences, these are memories of the time that they served or that they lived through when America was fighting overseas. I do get very emotional through a lot of these performances, it's true. As we're coming forward, uh, people stand to their feet in acknowledgement of their U.S. military. And there are times when those cheers and uh, the waving of flags and such just really touch your heart, make you know that what you're doing is still relevant and still carries um, great meaning for the people who are our citizens. Being a, a member of the Army National Guard has been something that I've carried with a lot of pride. Having that association with our U.S. military through music has just been one of the highest points in my life. There have been some concert music performances that we've done in which the music has had so much meaning behind it that you get overwhelmed with emotion just by the impact that those musical sounds made and that hush that came across the audience right at the end of the music as it sunk into them and they felt that emotion and then came to the applause as well because they understood what it was that we were bringing through the musical notes. And it is a supercharged emotional impact, without a doubt. the latest listing of upcoming performances by the 38th Infantry Division Band, or to learn more about the Indiana National Guard, visit in.ng.mil. Well, that is all the time that we have for tonight. We hope you feel inspired by our brave military men and women. 
to our veterans, we say thank you. Once more before we go, the 38th Infantry Division Brass Quintet. Good night. Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. Smithville Fiber, the Giga City Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you 